bug types have historically been the weakest type of Pokemon, but the more recent generations have done a lot to improve the type. So today, I'm gonna see if I can beat the most difficult game to Nuzlocke using only the weakest type. And if you've seen a hardcore Nuzlocke video before, you know the rules, but if not, they're gonna be on screen right now and in the description down below. And the lineup of possible encounters in this run is looking quite promising, I must say. A lot of my favorites on this list. So without any further ado, let's get under the Alolan sun. My name is Axel, and based off of how I dress myself, I'd say I'm trying to get bullied in this game. It looks like it's probably food, but when did mom buy it? No, where did she buy it? There's not a single grocery store on Melly Melly Island. Slide and glide, ride the waves, watch the water splash as you soar through the air. Come have the ride of your life experience, Mantine Surfing. Yeah, because that went so well last time. We get to try out Mantine Surfing. It is awesome. <laughs> anyway, it's finally time to pick our starter, so I go with Poplio so that How gets Litten, which is super effective against our bug types. We can then go to Route 1 to get our first encounter, which happens to be a Grubbin. I capture it and name it Banana, and it has a lax nature, which really isn't that bad for the beginning since we want some good defense. I then want to talk about Route 1 for a second. This route has a ton of different areas with completely different encounter tables, and a lot of players consider these new areas to get Pokemon and Nuzlocks. For this run, I will allow one more encounter since my previous five attempts to beat Alima were impossible with just the Grubbinator. So in the next area, I've managed to find myself a Caterpie, which I I capture and name Grape. It has a neutral hardy nature, which is pretty good, and after just a few fights against wild Pokemon, it evolves into a Metapod. And we then have to take on our first deadly challenge against our rival, Howe. He starts out with a Pichu, so I start with Banana and start Vice Gripping, but after getting Charmed, I feel it's time to swap out into Metapod. I do end up tanking a Thundershock really well and take out the Pichu with a Tackle, but then comes the real problem, Litten. Now, for whatever reason, it likes to go for Scratch instead of Ember here, so I can fire off a String Shot and swap out into Banana. Then after a mud slap, it does go for Ember, which it misses because of the accuracy drop, and this is pretty much how we're gonna have to cheese the entire early game. Evasion strats isn't exactly the most honorable of strategies, but you gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. We don't get through the fight without a scratch, but without an Ember, and that's all I can ask for. And then go ahead and pick up the Quick Claw at the Trainer School, after which we have an encounter with Team Skull where I get to level 10, which means that Metapod evolves into a beautiful Butterfree. And Butterfree's basically the only thing that's gonna make it possible to get through the beginning of this run because next up we have to face off against Alima who starts out with a young goose. And you know how I said we were going to be using accuracy strats? Well, I just keep going for mud slap here until this thing is at minus six accuracy, after which I swap out into Butterfree. And we're going to do what, well, not Butterfree does best, but what Metapod does best and set up with Harden. And honestly, what makes this fight so difficult is the fact that this young goose has Leer. It basically just sets you up to get taken out by the Smeargle afterwards. So we're going to prevent that by getting to plus six with Harden. Maximum hardness, Metapod! After which, we can take out Young Goose with Gust. It does take a bit of time since Alima uses a potion, but then it's only Smeargle left. And this thing can take a little bit more of a beating, but after four Gusts, we're done with Smeargle and done with Alima. Always an annoying fight. I bet you have a ride with Mantine Surf! No thanks. We then move on to Route 2, where I find my next encounter, a cutie fly that I name Lemon. It has a quirky nature, and at this point, we're ready to take on the first trial versus Gumshoes. Now, this thing is pretty strong for the early game, and it also gets its defense boosted, so we're gonna have to try and hit it from the special side. But my first order of business is to fire off a mud slap to lower accuracy as I get my speed halved. It then calls in a young goose, misses as I go for another mud slap and get hit by the young goose. Basically, what Banana's here to do is to just fire off mud slap against both of these Pokemon until it's at low enough health where we have to swap it out, but it actually ends up doing a very good job at dodging attacks, so we keep it in for a pretty long time, get them low on accuracy, and swap out into Butterfree. Now from here, the intended strategy was actually very simple, just to try and use Harden to boost my defense as much as possible and watch them miss, but that's not exactly what happened. See, instead what happened is that I got hit by pretty much every single move they threw at me, so my Orenberry activated, but it wasn't looking good. So I change up my strategy at this point to just take out the Young Goose, and then I go ahead and swap out into Lemon. And Lemon gets hit by a powerful tackle right away into Orenberry range, and the next turn I decide to paralyze Gumshoes with a Stun Spore. From there, it's just a matter of hoping that I can dodge moves and firing off Fairy Winds until we eventually win. If this fight's any indication of what's to come, then it's about to get rough, buddy. 
I was wondering, Axel, do you like reading books? Yeah, sure. I love a good... That's good to hear. That means you'll enjoy reading the Pokedex, too, right? Rotom, you cheeky mother... Anyway, we get a grand trial to take care of, and this one is very easily taken care of. We just use Gust and Fairy Wind, and that's it for the grand trial. It's not always rocket science, especially not since we had both a fairy type and a flying type for this one, so that's it for Melly Melly Island. Before we leave the island, however, I make sure to go and pick up the Thief TM just so that we can go visit a few Munchlaxes and steal their leftovers. A Lola trial goer? Have you never seen a surfer before? Keegan, I'm Scandinavian. We don't have waves. Of course I've never seen a surfer before. But it's time for redemption. Ooh, uh. Come on, come on, come on. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I can do it. <laughs> Once on Akawa Island, we have a fight with Hal, but it ends up being pretty easy, and we then have to go up against Gladion. And even he goes down super easy, but the face he makes when we beat him, it looks like he got rejected by his dream college. Anyway, after that, we prepare for the next trial fight, and while leveling to the next level cap, Grubbin evolves into Chargebug. More commonly referred to as the Hype Train. It's then time for the Big Bad Araquinid, and since we can't get any encounters before this thing, we're just gonna have to take it on with what we got. And even though this thing gets a speed boost, it's still super slow so we can outspeed and put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. Then it decides to call its ally Pokemon Dupider, and both it and its ally can do quite a lot of damage with Bubble in the Rain. After putting them both to sleep, I decide to use Electroweb to lower their speed, but Araquinid actually has a berry to reduce the damage. After taking a bubble when Araquinid wakes up, I obviously have to put it back to sleep, which is when Dewpider wakes up and hits me with a Sticky Web, after which I can take it out with an Electroweb. The next turn, I do even more damage with Electroweb, but it wakes up and hits me with a bubble which does massive damage in the rain. It then calls its other ally Pokemon Masquerain, which can't do anything to us, so we put it back to sleep. After getting paralyzed, I try for another Electroweb, but it's really not doing any damage whatsoever. And on top of that, Araquanid wakes up and leaves me at 5 HP after a bubble. It's safe to say that I have to switch out Butterfree at this point, so I go into Banana, who's now an Electric type. And the next turn, I make the mistake of the century and misclick Charge instead of going for Spark. This means I'm left in KO range, but somehow I outspeed the Araquanid and take it out with a Spark the next turn, so maybe that Charge actually worked out. The next turn, I know I can live a Bug Bite, so I decide to go for another Spark and that's it for Trial 2. Araquanid and I must have been speed tied for those last two turns, which is crazy. After the totem fight, we're allowed to get our encounter at Brooklet Hill, and I find a Dewpider the first thing I do, which I capture and name Blueberry. And not only does it have the Water Bubble ability, which boosts Water type moves by 100%, but also an Adamant Nature, which is perfect. And since our newly captured Dewpider evolves at level 22, which also happens to be the level cap, I do a bit of leveling up, and we finally have ourselves an Araquanid. The team's really starting to look like something now. It's then time for the Fire Trial, and my only question is, why are they butt posing? Yeah, if you could just perk up your butts a little bit more, I'm talking to you, Hecker David. Anyway, we have to worry about the totem Pokemon, and if we didn't have a Raquinid, I'd say we're screwed. Not only does Water Bubble boost water moves by 100%, it also reduces fire moves by 50%, and we can't get burned. So after setting up our rain with Rain Dance, it calls its ally Pokemon Salazzle, which I blast out of this universe with a stab boosted, water bubble boosted, rain boosted Bubble Beam. I almost do the same to Marowak, but it barely survives, so I have to wait a turn for it to detect and then take it out with another Bubble Beam. That was pretty easy as trials go, and I was pretty worried about the fire trial, but Araquanid, total monster. After the fight, I'm going through the tunnel to Route 8, and I knew I could get Wimpod here, but not exactly how, and then I kind of accidentally stumble upon it, so I go ahead and capture it and name it Cantaloupe. And Impish is a pretty good nature because of Emergency Exit, and very shortly after that catch, it's time for us to take on the fourth trial, and I don't think anybody in the audience expects this to be difficult. This thing only has Bug and Grass moves to attack me with. The only very annoying thing that this thing was able to do is royally waste my time for several turns as it just went for synthesis and floral healing as I tried to take it out with signal beam. Eventually though, it ran out of its synthesis PP and went for an X scissor so I can take it out with another signal beam and that's the fourth trial in the bag. Not exactly quantum physics there boys, bug beats grass, it's how it's always been. The game then decides to show me the opposite of phallic symbolism, not quite sure what to do with that game. We then have a little encounter with Team Skull together with Hal and I get to level 25 with Lemon, which means it evolves into a Ribombi. And this thing may be small and frail looking, but it can put in some serious work on the battlefield. We also arrive in the very cozy Coney Coney City. Here we can pick up items like the Eviolite and also a fossil so that we can bring back our next encounter, Anorith. I named this little guy Pineapple and it ends up having the battle armor ability, which means it can't get 
crit, which is so awesome in Nuzlocke's. But this means that it's finally time to take on Akala Island's Kahuna, Olivia. Now she leads up with her max speed Anorith, which is so fast it takes out more than half my health on Blueberry before I can set up an Iron Defense. The next turn, I get Smackdown for substantially less damage, and I set up a second Iron Defense. At this point, Smackdown's doing very little, and I can get a bunch of health back using Leech Life. The next turn, of course I get hit again, but I can go for a second Leech Life, which leaves me at 36 HP, which is fairly good for the incoming Leap. I then use Leech Life, which gets me back up to over half health, and Ancient Power doesn't do that much because Araquanid's special defense is just godly for some reason. Finally, we got Lycanroc, and I am so afraid of the Continental Crush, but it goes for Bite for some reason so I can set up the Rain Dance. It just continues to go for Bite. I can't tell you why, I can't tell you how, it just does it, and I can take it out with a couple of Bubble Beams. If anybody can tell me in the comments why the AI did that, did it not see the KO with the, the with the Continental Crush? I, I don't get it. Saves us casualties, though, so I'll take it. We then have to go to Ether Paradise, and this guy kind of looks like a bug with those glasses. Can I catch you, Faba? Oh, you want a Malasada? How? My dude, I'm Swedish. I only ever eat meatballs. After we arrive on Ula Ula, we can finally get our next encounter, which happens to be a Masquerain, which is awesome since it has the Intimidate ability. I name it Kiwi, and on Route 10, I actually accidentally run into my encounter again, a Pineco. I decide to fittingly name it Coconut, and it has a neutral nature and sturdy, which is gonna come in so clutch later on. It also evolves just before the level cap at level 30 one into a fortress, and this thing is a defensive powerhouse. And speaking of evolving, Cantaloupe finally reaches level 30 through the experience share, because it's too weak to use, for sure, and it ends up evolving into a Golisopod, one of my personal favorite Pokemon. And with those team preparations out of the way, it's time to take on the fifth trial versus Togedomaru. And what can I say about this trial, except for the fact that it was a real slog. It took forever in real life. You see, my plan here was very simple. I'd taught Bulldoze to my fortress, and I was gonna take this thing out, but what I didn't anticipate is that it would paralyze me and flinch me to no end. You see, the combination of Iron Defense, Leftovers, and Protect made it so that I basically couldn't take any damage from these things whatsoever, and so even though I'm pretty much an impenetrable wall at this point, as you can see, I really don't do that much damage with Bulldoze, even though it's quad effective. And as soon as Bounce paralyzed me, I knew that this was gonna take forever and that it was gonna be a flinch fest, baby. And to prove that this took forever, Togedomaru actually uses Struggle, and I can take it out with the following Bulldoze. How did I manage to accidentally PP stall a Pokemon I meant to just take out with Bulldozes? That's my luck for you. And so that's how I got the Electrium Z with probably the weirdest accidental strat ever. Moving on though, since it's nighttime, we can find ourselves an Ariados, which I name Apple. I then decide to go into this trailer, and well, what the heck do you think you're doing, huh? Did someone say you could come in here? I mean, this guy makes a good point. Why is every stranger's house unlocked in the Pokemon? Pokemon world. But with that, it's time for us to take on our sixth trial versus Mimikyu, which could prove to be kinda tricky with our current team. I decide to lead with Kiwi to get an Intimidate drop, and after taking a play rough, I decide to break its disguise by using Icy Wind, because that way I get a secondary effect of lowering its speed as well. Then comes Banette, so I decide to swap out into Fortress, who can tank moves very, very well. And the following turn, after enduring both a Shadow Claw and a Screech, I set up a Reflect to minimize the damage they can do to me. But since I've been Screeched, I decide to swap out into Butterfree, who tanks a few moves fairly well, and I try to put it to sleep, but I forget that it has a Lumberry. So that means that Butterfree is at really low HP now, and I pretty much just wasted it. On top of that, Bonette goes for Curse, so I almost get taken out, but at least that's half of its HP. Rabombi gets screeched on the switch in, but I go for a Draining Kiss just to see if I can take out Bonette, but it barely hangs on, and I almost get taken out by Play Rough and Burn. So I decide to swap out into Apple, who takes over half damage on switch in, but at least I can take out Bonette with a Shadow Sneak. But this sadly means that I have to go down to a Shadow Claw from Mimic. You. Or I can hang on on 2 HP and swap out into Kiwi. You're the boss, Apple. Since I had the Intimidate, I know I can take another play rough, but I'm left at 8 HP and I lower its speed with another Icy Wind. Then it's finally Cantaloupe's time to shine, and luckily I don't take that much from a play rough, and Iron Head does decent damage. But at this point, Mimikyu calls out its ally Pokemon, Jellicent, so I decide to target it instead, and I almost managed to take it out with a Shadow Claw. The next turn, Mimikyu hits me with a Pitiful Slash, and I can take out Jellicent with another Shadow Claw. After that, I get hit pretty low, but I can take Mimikyu you down into the red. Then it's finally time to swap back out into Coconut and finish the job with a Gyro Ball. And I mean, I know we got through that with no casualties, but just look at our team afterwards. It's totally devastated. Now that we have Sharpedo as a ride Pokemon, we can go to Sandy Cave, which admittedly I had no idea it existed, and pick up the Light Clay. Then as we're making our way through Po Town, Anorith finally gets to level 
140, which means it evolves into Armaldo. Then we have to fight Guzma in his hideout, but since we didn't lose anybody in this fight and it was pretty easy, I decided to only include the third one. And that means it's on to Nanu and his dark types, and since we're running bug types, well, you can guess how it goes. And since Robombi has the shield dust ability, Fake Out actually can't flinch us, and we can just take out Sableye with two draining kisses. Then it's on to Persian, which I know has power gem, but it goes for Fake Out as we switch to Armaldo, but really, it can't do anything to us, so I'm free to take it out with a couple of X scissors. Then finally, we got Krakorok, but since it intimidates us and we're at pretty low health, I decide to switch out into Kiwi, who intimidates back. We can dodge the predicted earthquake, unfortunately get hit by Swagger, but we do break through that confusion and take out Krakorok in one hit. And that's all she wrote for Ula Ula Island, but before we can go to Pony, we have to go to the Aether Foundation where we can pick up Toxic. Wait, so Cosmog might be an Ultra Beast? Yeah, the words Ultra and Beast specifically aren't really what come to mind when I think of that little space fart. <laughs> Yo, 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 pretty strong, ain't you? Then go right ahead, I'm no numbskull. I don't fight battles I can't win. Uh-huh, got it, not a numbskull. Totally, bro. Now, even though we've easily beaten Guzma twice, Gladion can't seem to beat this guy, so we're gonna have to take him on a third time. This time, he actually kind of packs a punch, so I go ahead and decide to lead with Kiwi as he sends out his signature Galissapod. After getting off an Intimidate, I decide to go for Air Slash right away since I outspeed and I even almost take him out, but it sends him out with Emergency Exit. I decide to send in Fortress to set up Reflect, but it takes out a big chunk of my health with Stone Edge. After Reflect, I can tank Stone Edge fairly well, set up a Light Screen, and swap out into Golisopod. Deathly afraid of a crit, I go for a Rock Slide, which does about half damage, and after going below half but then having a Citrus Berry, I can finally take him out with another Rock Slide. This means his next Pokemon is Vikavolt, and I outspeed and do about half with a Rock Slide after he sends me out with Emergency Exit. So I swap in Pineapple, who can outspeed and take him out with a Rock Slide. This means Glycopod is back, but I have Reflect, so I hit him with a Rock Slide, and he's out for the count. Guzma's last Pokemon is Masquerain, and even after Intimidate, I can just take him out with a Rock Slide. I still don't understand why they nerfed Guzma from Sun and Moon to Ultra. Like, they should have just let him have Sword Stance on Golisopod. It makes him way scarier. After Guzma's defeat, we go deeper into the Aether Foundation, where we find out that Lusamine is taxidermying Pokemon. Obviously, this is something that we can't support here on the Antler Boy channel, so we have to take Lusamine down. And Lusamine is generally a pretty scary fight. It's obviously way worse in Sun and Moon when she gets all her Pokemon boosted, but we start out with Coconut versus her Clefable. It actually does a fair amount of damage with its special moves, so I make sure to set up both Light Screen and Reflect holding the Light Clay. I then swap out into Golisopod, who because of the screens can tank the hits fairly well, because as you know, we can only get to half health with this thing before it gets forced out. A couple of super effective Iron Heads then take out Clefable, and we have to square off against Lopunny, but it just sends us away with a Fire Punch. And it pretty much sends us into the perfect Pokemon. Armaldo. See, Lopunny has all the elemental punches, which means it has a super effective move against every other Pokemon on our team, so we kind of lucked out there. After taking it out, our light screen actually wears off as she sends in Milotic, which is terrible timing, so I swap into Blueberry. Then expecting it to go for Dragon Pulse, I swap into Lemon, but I barely survive a Hydro Pump. So I have to swap out again into Cantaloupe, and this time I can go for the first impression, which does huge amounts of damage. But even Cantaloupe can barely hang on, so I have to swap back into Araquanid, who can tank these Hydro Pumps fairly well, I guess, and go for lunge until we take out the Milotic. And honestly, that was way too close a call for both Cantaloupe and Lemon, but next up is Lilligant, so I swap into Kiwi, who resists every single move this Lilligant has. Unfortunately, though, it can survive an Air Slash on very low HP and go for a Teeter Dance since it doesn't get confused itself by Petal Dance because of its own tempo ability. Luckily, we break through, but against Beware, we don't have a great switch in since our team is looking pretty roughed up. So I swap into Fortress, but it takes huge amounts of damage from Takedown, so we have to go into Pineapple, who's pretty much at full. Now, while Pineapple can take hits, I really don't have any moves that can do damage to Beware, so I end up having to switch out, but the team is looking so weak at the moment. So I make the tough decision that I'm gonna have to sack off Kiwi to get the Intimidate, but I end up getting the Citrus Berry upon switch in. This means I can survive Zen Headbutt, fire off an Air Slash, and the next turn he goes for Drain Punch? Okay, I honestly have no idea why it didn't just go for the kill there. It clearly could have, but we we get to keep Kiwi, so that's cool. Our next destination is Pony Island, where we meet the trial captain Mina, and let's just say that she looks like she's one paintbrush short of a set. You reached out and touched the statue. There was no reaction from the statue. Uh, yeah, game, that's what I'd expect from a statue. But now that we're on Pony Island, we can use the Machamp Ride Pokemon. And this means we can reach a specific location in the lush jungle that I had no idea existed before this run. And in this area, we can move this boulder so that we can find the TM for Energy Ball, which is gonna help us out a lot later in the run. 
And since I purposefully never got an encounter in the Lush Jungle, we can run around in this cave until we find the 1% encounter for Larvesta, which I just chuck a Master Ball at right away. It has a neutral nature, and I fittingly name it Starfruit. We then set sail for Executor Island in this boat. Are you sure this thing floats? And here we're actually forced to encounter our next Pokemon, which is going to be a pincer that I named Pattaya. And I gotta say that Executor really knows how to rock and roll. But since we're on Pony Island, that means we have access to the vast Pony Canyon, and since Banana levels up, it evolves into a Vicavolt. And another thing we have to do in the vast Pony Canyon is face off against Totem Kamoo. And you might think that this would be a really easy fight for Lemon to beat, but not only does Kamoo hold a Roselli Berry to reduce the damage from fairy type moves, it also has poison jabs, so Lemon's pretty much a no-go. And since pretty much all my other Pokemon go down to Air Slash from Noivern, I decide to use a little bit a Toxic Stall with Fortress. Now, personally, I don't think that Toxic Stall is a very fun strategy, so I'm going to avoid using it wherever I can in this run. I think I only used it twice. The only times I'm actually going to use Toxic Stall is when I feel it's necessary. Like, I could have used a different strategy here, but it would have probably lost me Pokemon, so it would have been a dumb decision from a Nuzlocke perspective. So while I try to use as fun strategies as possible, I'm not just going to throw a game for content. Besides, I've got some killer strats planned for the Elite Four. Just you wait. Now, to catch you up with what's going on in the story here, Ultra Necrozma is trying to engulf the entire universe in darkness, so we can't really have that since I kind of enjoy being Alola's top model. And this, of course, means that we have to face off against the dumbest boss fight in all of Pokemon, Ultra Necrozma. And since this thing has all its stats boosted and is a ridiculous legendary Pokemon at level 60, there's pretty much two ways to do this. Either you figure out a way to find a sturdy Pokemon and toxic it, or you use Focus Sash. I mean, there's certainly other strategies you can use to cheese this thing, for example, leading with a Zoroark and having a fight type or poison Pokemon in the back so that it uses its psychic moves over and over again. But since we only have access to bug types, the only thing we can do is unfortunately have to sacrifice both Ariados and our Butterfree. Bye bye Butterfree. You were a true hero alongside the other members of our team all the way back from Route 1, and I'll never forget what you did to make this run possible. Anyway, now that we've defeated Ultra Necrozma, it's time for us to take on the final trial versus Mina and all the other trial captains to get this little flower thing so that we can finally face Rabombi. And for this thing, I gotta say I employed a very simple strategy. I had a backup plan in mind if it didn't work, but I started out with Pinsir, who I made sure to level up getting only special defense EVs so that I could live a bug buzz 100% of the time here and fire off with a stone edge that ends up getting a crit and we just win, bypassing the boost. So, uh, GG. Since that Totem Rabombi has two Omni boosts, I'm pretty glad to have it out of the way. But this means that we only have one Grand Trial left before we can take on the Elite Four, and this is versus Hapu and her ground types. And while the Elite Four was incredibly tricky to plan for, Hapu was pretty much a no-brainer. I just led with Kiwi to go for the Intimidate so that Golurk can't do that much damage, and then it's time to set up the Quiver Dances. I pretty much got three Quiver Dances on Kiwi for free, and then I could just sweep the team with Energy Balls and Icy Wind. Honestly, I've had problems with Hapu in the past doing runs of Usum, so I'm very glad that this one went so smoothly. Then on our way to Victory Road, we have to crush Gladion's hopes and dreams once again. And after going to the restaurants to pick up some hard scales to finalize my movesets, there's nothing left to do but challenge the Elite Four. And so I forged some strategies that can hopefully take us to victory and decided that the first member we're going to challenge is Acerola. And since she has a Bannet that you can pretty freely set up on, I decide to lead with Intimidate and then swap out into Coconut to set up the Reflect. I also decide to set up Stealth Rock just for good measure before I swap out back into Kiwi with Intimidate. Now with both Reflect Up and my to attack on Banet, I can pretty freely set up as many quiver dances as I want, only keeping in mind that Driftlim does have the aftermath ability, so I can't go down to too low health. I also needed to be at over half health for Frostlass's Ice Shard if it went for it, but then Palisand survives and it goes for a Go See move. And at this point, I thought it was all over. I need Intimidate for the rest of the E4, but I managed to survive. However, this causes a bit of a problem since she sends in Driftlim after Palisand, and since it has aftermath, we have to swap out. So I decided to go into Cantaloupe, who can hit this thing with Sucker Punch, but it starts out by going for Amnesia, and then it goes for Focus Energy, so we only hit it on the third time, and we don't quite take it out. Next, it goes for Ominous Wind, and it gets the Omni Boost! What are the odds? Then I barely survive the next one on 9 HP with a critical hit that sends me out with Emergency Exit. Fortunately, though, Blueberry is both tanky enough to tank the Ominous Wind and take the Aftermath after Driftblum goes down, and that's it for Acerola. It was a bit of a rocky ride, but not as rocky a ride as it's gonna be to face up against Olivia. 
Fortunately though, we have Fortress who can set up a Reflect the first turn and then go for the Stealth Rocks just so that we can break Sturdy on Probopass down the line. I also decide to set up two layers of Toxic Spikes because who knows, it could be pretty difficult to take on a Rock type team with our Bug types. After this, I definitely want a fresh Reflect up before I swap out into a Raquanid since we're probably going to have to tank a Rock Blast here, so I stall a whole bunch so that I can set up Reflect once again. Then expecting an X Scissor, I swap out into Kiwi just to get another Intimidate before I swap into Blueberry who can fortunately tank the Rock Blast fairly okay, but it's finally time for Blueberry's time in the spotlight for that water bubble boosted liquidation to just tear through Olivia's entire team. Well, at least almost her entire team, Probopass comes out and since we had Stealth Rock we can take it out with a single liquidation, but when Credilly comes out we do have to use two Leech Lives. Fortunately for me though, she just uses a full heal because of our Toxic Spike, so we're pretty free to just take it out. And that's it for Olivia who I wasn't that worried about, but next is Kahili, and since I didn't bring our Maldo or our Vicavolt, this is gonna be pretty tough. I lead off with Kiwi for Intimidate, and with the help of a Koba Berry, I can actually survive a Brave Bird so that I can go for a Quiver Dance and take out the Braviary with a Blizzard the next turn. And now this is where the strategy gets pretty stupid. See, I employed pretty much the dumbest strategy of all time. Since Mandibuzz is pretty weak and it can't really hurt Fortress, I decide to just stall it out of all its 15 Brave Birds because that's the only dangerous thing it can do to my team. And I'm not gonna lie, this took an eternity and a half, but eventually it ran out of all its 15 Brave Birds and we could swap out into Lemon. I did make sure to get my Reflect up beforehand though, but when we send in Lemon, we get hit by a Flatter, which we can heal off with a Person Berry and just get a free plus two special attack boost. But that doesn't really matter since it hits me with Flatter again as I'm setting up my Quiver Dances, but I'm not that afraid since it can only hit me with Bone Rush. Although I will say because of the annoying confusion, it actually got me down to pretty low health and I was getting a bit worried about Lemon, but eventually Lemon pulls through and I can just sweep through her entire team with Dazzling Gleams. I can't believe I actually had to resort to using PP stall for two whole fights in this game, but yeah, it is what it is, I guess. And the important thing here is that I got Larvesta up to almost level 58 when we entered the Elite Four, since I'm only allowed to be at 57 when I enter, but it's okay to level up afterwards, so now we have Volcarona going into the fight against Molane. And even though we learned Quiver Dance upon evolution with Volcarona, we can't just hop in and set up even if we have a Cherry Berry, because Prankster Thunder Wave will make it so that even if we heal it off, it's just gonna priority Thunder Wave us right away. So my strategy became sending in Cantaloupe and using Taunt against this thing so that we can swap out into Volcarona and get two free turns to set up Quiver Dances. This is so important because the turn that Taunt wears off, we have to go for Flamethrower to take out Klefki. It will paralyze us, we'll heal with Cherry Berry, but then we don't have to deal with Prankster the turn afterwards. And so after three Quiver Dances, there we go, we get paralyzed, heal it off, and manage to take it out without ending up paralyzed. Another very important detail is that Coconut set up the Stealth Rocks beforehand so that we can actually break the Sturdy of Magnazone when it comes out, which means we don't have to deal with getting paralyzed by it. So with just a little bit of careful planning and strategizing, we managed to get through Molane without losing a Pokemon, which means we have a full team of six going into the Champions battle, which is perfect. And this means that we might actually have the chance to beat the most difficult Pokemon game to Nuzlocke with the weakest type of Pokemon. And it took a bit of strategizing to work out how we were gonna do it, but since Hal starts out with Raichu, I decided our best bet is to give Galissapod the Silver Powder and just absolutely destroy Raichu's world with a priority first impression. We then have to go up against Crabominable, and I don't have a great matchup against this thing with my bug types against its Stone Edge, so I decided to put up a Reflect and use Toxic. I then switch into Masquerain, honestly just to get an Intimidate, but it misses its Stone Edge. That means I can freely take it out with an Air Slash, but now we have to deal with level 60 Incineroar. Fortunately though, we have Blueberry, which is the perfect answer to this thing because even Darkest Lariat doesn't do that much and we just barely don't take it out with Liquidation. Al then withdraws Incineroar to send in Noiburn, and we surprisingly do quite a lot with Liquidation, but the next turn, since they have a Koba Berry, I decide to go for Icy Wind, which admittedly doesn't do that much. However, even though we have to sack off Blueberry here, it sets us up well so that we can outspeed the max speed Noiburn with our little Lemon. Hal then sends in Incineroar and I expect him to go for a full restore, so I set up a Quiver Dance and then go for a Hidden Power Ground and it actually does about half. But I never get to use my second Hidden Power Ground because Hal decides to use Inferno Overdrive and if there's a way to overkill a Rabombi, well, he just invented it. So my next play is to send in my only water type I have left, Cantaloupe, and I know I can take this thing out with a Liquidation, but I get hit by a fairly powerful Flare Blitz that also burns me, but luckily Liquidation does enough after Recoil. 
Hal's next Pokemon is Tauros, and it intimidates us, so I decide to swap out into Kiwi to get my own Intimidate off, because this thing is a true menace. Kiwi then gets immediately taken out by a double edge as I send in my Fortress to try to set up the Reflect. This is pretty much the only way I'm safely going to be able to get Invulcarona against Earthquake from this thing, but I also managed to Toxic it just to do some passive damage. But since we now have Reflect for six more turns, Tauros can't even really touch us with Earthquake, so I'm free to set up as many Quiver Dances as I want. And so that's exactly what I do. I may have gotten a bit greedy with it since a critical hit would have totally destroyed my world, but it was a risk I was willing to take for glorious greatness. But eventually, when I got to low enough HP and high enough stats, I decide to click Flamethrower and that's it for Tauros. Finally, Hal makes a last-ditch effort with a quick attack from Leafeon, but it's not enough and it gets taken out, which means that we're the champions of Alola. That's right, I did it. I beat a Pokemon Ultra Sun Hardcore Nuzlocke using only bug types. We may have lost half the team on the way during the champion fight, but you know what? It was a price we had to pay to beat this run. And listen, what have we learned? Well, they've done a pretty good job at improving the bug type over the years. Volcarona? Araquanid? They're pretty crazy. And listen up, viewer. If you got all the way to the end of this video, then you're the champ, and I appreciate your existence, and I'd hope that you'd appreciate mine by hitting that subscribe button, because if not, what are you doing? I'd also highly recommend you check out my good friend Keegan J, who makes Pokemon Challenge videos on YouTube. He was the surfer guy earlier on. And other than that, definitely let me know down in the comments below which game and type you would like to see next. But until we see each other next time, ladies and gentlemen, have a good one.